Uh, well, seals may seem a bit esoteric as a subject, uh, and indeed they appear to me always to be the preserve of medievalists. For scholars of a later period, and I'm an 18th century specialist, they seem really only to have interested those connoisseurs of relatively obscure tastes in the 18th century who collected seal matrices. After the end of the 17th century, they seem to have pretty much disappeared from scholarship. But among the Society of Antiquaries, an interest in seals persisted. In 1752, at a meeting of the Society, Mr. Martin, sorry, Mr. Adam Martin showed over 200 seal impressions from the Earl of Arundel's library. The Society, of course, has a distinguished collection of over 10,000 seal impressions and seals, ranging from uh, large and impressive royal and episcopal seals to small personal seals. Seal impressions in the 18th century often collected alongside coins and autographs. Uh, and here are two examples of the way in which seals were collected. On the left, you have almost a sort of taxonomy of seals. Seals collected and arranged clearly with a sort of organising principle behind them. And on the right, seals for display that you show to your friends and guests and visitors uh, with the intention of wowing them with your latest acquisition. One of the principal seal collectors of the period, Richard Rawlinson, was a fellow and vice president of the Society of Antiquaries uh, before he fell out with it and resigned. And indeed, he cut it from his will uh, with the result that uh, probably his uh, most extraordinary collection of, of European magnitude of seals was lost to the Society. Rawlinson was known to be willing to pay huge sums for particular seal impressions that he sought. Now, the academic study of seals, sigillography, was by the end of the 19th century a largely dry and largely descriptive activity. It yielded those large catalogues, often lavishly illustrated, but it made little impact on uh, beyond a small community of enthusiasts. Then, in the early 20th century, Thomas Tagg, professor of history at Lampeter and then at Manchester, realised that seals offered insights into the character and practices of royal and ecclesiastical households. Who used the seal and for what purposes were not static, and these changes said a good deal about the development of the machinery of government, both in the church and state. More recently, the digitization of seals and their catalogues has enabled scholars to exploit them further and draw them out from the shadows. But for the most part, this area does remain a field dominated by medievalists and hasn't attracted much attention from 18th century scholars. Now, despite the sidelining of seals as antiquarian objects, they loom large in the imagery of national events. We're all familiar with this item, the death warrant of Charles I, replete with the small personal seal impressions attesting to each of the regicides' decisions that the king should die. For historians, uh, we are, are used to seeing seals in county record offices, in letters of ecclesiastical orders, faculties for church building, evidence of land transactions, and of course other legal documents. It's sad that in the 18th century, seals were largely, or gradually replaced, I should say, by stamps, that confirmed that the stamp duty or the paper tax had been paid. And signing across the stamp, indicating that the uh, tax had been paid, was as good an identifier of a personal attestation as a seal. Hence, paper tax stamps tended to uh, phase out seals. Of course, stamp duty was enormously popular with the Treasury because it was so easy to collect. And indeed, the list of things that stamp duty uh, was placed on gives an indication of how extraordinarily successful it was to uh, collect. Uh, the list includes newspapers, pamphlets, lottery tickets, indentures, advertisements, playing cards, dice, hats, gloves, 
patent medicines, perfumes, insurance policies, gold and silver plate, hair powder, and armorial bearings. <coughs> In the 18th century, of course, seals continued to be used to secure letters that went into the post. However, it's clear that the government's decipherer's office had mastered the art of opening seals and resealing them. In their offices in Abchurch Lane, a group of clergymen, and they were clergymen, undertook this secret work on behalf of the government. The most talented of them, who, was all, who also deciphered codes, was the Reverend Edward Wills, who was made Bishop of Bath and Wells as a reward for his work. There were also tradesmen seals, usually made in lead, uh, used especially for sealing uh, bales of wool and hemp, uh, but also, of course, there were bottle maker seals, uh, all, which also survived into the 18th century. These were seals which indicated volume, authenticity, and acted as a commercial guarantee of quality. In the case of cloth seals, manufacturers sometimes used different names and seals for cloth of different quality. So you could represent yourself as a high-end cloth manufacturer, but also sell uh, cloth of lesser quality under a different name. And we'll see this uh, theme of representing yourself in different ways uh, later on. In many cases, these tradesmen's uh, cloth seals were joined by port seals from the towns through which they passed. And customs officials, post officers, port officers, and tradesmen became proficient in identifying Dutch, French, Scandinavian, Russian, and even Chinese seals. Bottle seals uh, became common after 1650 and were used to show ownership of a bottle and occasionally the manufacturer of the bottle and its contents. By the middle of the 18th century, when inns and breweries began to add their seals to bottles, the bottom dropped out of this connoisseur high-end use of wine seals, uh, and they were less likely to be displayed in elite households. Bottle seals have been especially carefully examined by both the Museum of London and the V&A, which have large collections of them. Seals for food items were not uncommon, uh, particularly uh, among the, the London Jewish community, where kosher seals were important uh, on imported goods to demonstrate their kosher quality. And seals also played a part in more secretive groups in the 18th century. So early Freemasons used seals uh, to advertise, or documents which advertise Masonic business and notification of meetings. But it's with small personal seals that we're concerned this evening. By the 18th century, these fob seals became as much a matter of style and fashion as utility. Uh, here are three fob seals, and you can see all of them have a loop at the top, which you could connect them via with uh, some ribbon or a chain onto your waistcoat and slip them into your pocket. So these were small portable items um, which uh, a gentleman would carry. They might display uh, an armorial bearing or a classical image to emphasize either the owner's status or taste. Um, as we'll see, these uh, small fob seals often were made with three faces, and it's those that I'm particularly interested in this evening. Um, they were sufficiently widespread for advertisements to appear in London newspapers advertising rewards for their return. Um, so the 18th century saw a good deal of these small fob seals in circulation. Later in the 18th century, grand tourists returned from Italy with intaglio seals, often brought back as souvenirs, and to show your friends and neighbours uh, that they had obtained the best cut Italian seals. Small personal seals used a range of imagery, as I've said, crests, armorial bearings, mottos, initials, symbols of some personal significance. Sometimes individual mottos were cut into the seals. John Wesley used this seal, uh, cut with the words, believe, love, and obey. Others used their initials, as we'll see. 
and images with a personal meaning. In such cases, the seal played the part of authenticating who the letter came from. You would recognise who the letter came from, from the seal on the outside. Um, so it was an important message before you even opened uh, the, the letter that it was from somebody you knew. The wider history of seals and their use, however, is largely incidental to the seals that I want to talk about this evening. The seals that I'm concerned about this evening are from the world of religion, politics, and treason. To set in context the seals I'm going to talk about, I want to introduce you to a very remarkable man, Dr. Henry Sacheverell, probably uh, in 1710, the best known man in London. Indeed, if you'd stood out on Piccadilly 310 years ago, Henry Sacheverell's name would have been on everybody's lips. He was a sensation, probably the first true celebrity of the modern age, and also one of the most hated men of his day. Sacheverell came from Puritan stock. Indeed, one of his ancestors had signed and sealed the death warrant of Charles I that we saw a minute ago. Another had been a Presbyterian who died in jail for refusing to conform to the Church of England at the Restoration. But Henry Sacheverell was made of very different stuff. He was a Tory high churchman with all the zeal of a convert. He had been at Oxford in the period when all tutors were required to denounce Republican doctrines to their students. Tutors were expected to tell students that people had no right of self-defense against tyrants and were required to obey, uh, required by God to obey their king. Having been ordained, Sir Chevrolet became a fellow of Magdalen College, Oxford. He gained the reputation of a fierce, controversial preacher. When in 1702 he preached against religious toleration for dissenters, he advised his fellow clergy to, quote, hang out the bloody flag and banner of defiance. Sir Chevrolet was one of those Tory high churchmen who had serious doubts about the legitimacy of the revolution of 1688. He didn't believe that people had the right to overthrow their monarch, even if he was a tyrant like James II. Sir so Chevrolet also thought that the Toleration Act, which allowed dissenters the freedom to worship as they wished, was harmful. He believed the church was in danger from the Whigs, who supported religious toleration, and in some cases would have extended it further. Sir so Chevrolet's doubts about the Glorious Revolution meant that he was close to the Jacobite treason that James II had remained king in 1689, and that his son, James Edward, was the rightful king too. Of course, Sir Chevrolet couldn't say this. Indeed, he outwardly proclaimed his loyalty to Queen Anne. But if he questioned the legitimacy of the revolution, surely people deduced he was at least a Jacobite fellow traveller, even if he wouldn't admit it. Now, all of this went down very well in Tory Jacobite Oxford, where Sir Chevrolet was a fellow of Magdalen College. But when he preached elsewhere, it was a different matter. In August 1709, he preached in Derby at the Assizes and was met with riots and public disturbances from opponents and supporters. In the same year, he was appointed chaplain at St. Saviour's Southwark, which brought him to prominence in London. Within a few weeks, it was said of Sir Chevrolet, quote, none is so much talked about as he is all over town. One of the aspects of Sir Chevrolet that unsettled people was his furious style. In the pulpit, he was described as having inflamed cheeks, spittle and foam at his mouth and bulging eyes. He seemed to shout his sermons at his congregations. He was an angry man and a manic preacher. He divided the country into those who admired and those who loathed him. 
On the 5th of November 1709, so 310 years and two days, if we ignore the calendar shift in the middle of the 18th century, um, so on the 5th of November 1709, the double anniversary, of course, of the gunpowder plot and of the landing of William of Orange in 1688, Henry Sacheverell preached an explosive sermon in St Paul's in front of the Lord Mayor, Sir Samuel Garrard, and the Alderman of London. And here are two images, one on the left, uh, a much later uh, recreation, I think, of Sir Sacheverell in full flood, uh, and on the right, a ceramic representation of Sir Sacheverell preaching. Before the sermon, during the prayers and hymns, a witness saw Sir Sacheverell sitting with the clergy, working himself up into an angry mood. It was said, quote, the fiery red overspread his face. His goggling wildness came into his eyes. He came into the pulpit like a sibyl to the mouth of her cave. His sermon was a furious attack on the glorious revolution. Sir Sacheverell accused low churchmen of being false brethren since they sympathised with dissenters and supported the Toleration Act that had been passed in the wake of the revolution. The sermon also suggested that the nation had violated the principle of passive obedience to a king in supporting William of Orange and implied that the Glorious Revolution was an error. For some, the sermon even seemed to question the right of Queen Anne to the throne. It certainly challenged the prospect of a Hanoverian succession. Sir Chevrolet also made fairly open attacks on the leading Whig ministers. The printed version of the sermon was an instant bestseller. Within a few weeks, 100,000 copies of the sermon had been printed, and one estimate is that it was read by 250,000 people, approximately the entire electorate of the country. I can't emphasise to you enough how astonishing those figures are. 100,000 printed copies and 250,000 readers. Easily the most widely read item other than the Bible and the Book of Common Prayer of its day. When he preached elsewhere, the churches were full and the congregations often spilled out into the graveyard. The Whig government was appalled not least because Sir Chevrolet had referred in the sermon to Lord Godolphin, the Lord Treasurer, as Volpone, the greedy and corrupt fox of Ben Jonson's play. At first, the government tried to ignore Sir Chevrolet, hoping that the uh, unrest would go away, but every sermon he gave was an occasion for disturbance and huge crowds. In the end, the government decided that Sir Chevrolet had to be impeached, which he was in February 1710. Uh, and here, are the, here is the proceedings of the trial of Sir Chevrolet. Impeachment, which is what Sir Chevrolet was subject to, was a much easier route uh, for uh, prosecution than a trial, because, of course, impeachment simply relied on a political vote rather than uh, a jury verdict. The trial was held in the House of Lords over three weeks, and was a sensation. London was daily transfixed by the latest events in the House of Lords, and everyone seemed to either support or oppose Sir Chevrolet. Among the most remarkable group of individuals who supported Sir Chevrolet were the London prostitutes, who reportedly supported him en masse. It was said that London prostitutes, I guess in Piccadilly as elsewhere, importuned their clients with the words are you for the doctor, sir? And here's an image uh, of Sir Chevrolet as the modern idol, the modern idol uh, attracting the support of the London prostitutes. On three evenings after the verdict, there were riots in London. In the end, the army had to be called in to suppress them. And here are two representations of the Sir Chevrolet riots. On the left, in particular, uh, the representation of the pulling down of a dissenting meeting house. The Sir Chevrolet rioters seem to have been pretty smart in spotting the places that they were going to go after. Uh, and among those they picked on were uh, the Whig uh, P 
peers and bishops in the House of Lords and dissenters' meeting houses. Although technically Sir Chevrolet was found guilty of the charge of sedition, his, ser- his sentence was so light that most people regarded it as an acquittal. His punishment was simply three years suspension from preaching uh, and the public burning of his sermon by the common hangman. In the wake of the trial, Sir Chevrolet conducted a triumphant tour of the country, which is thought to have swung the general election of 1710 to the Tories, who won by a landslide. It must be the only occasion on which a sermon has determined the outcome of a general election. I make no pause for a contemporary moment. Sir Chevrolet's sermon and trial represented the fault line that ran through the Tories in the three decades after the Glorious Revolution. Queen Anne, of course, was a Stuart and the daughter of James II, and therefore could claim to be a hereditary succeeder to the throne. Her title uh, to the th- her title to the throne was unchallenged by most, not least because she was a Tory. But the prospect of the succession as of Sophia of Hanover when Anne died seemed to Tory Jacobites as a perversion of the idea of heredity. Moreover, the Hanoverians were Lutherans, exactly the sort of dissenters that Sir Chevrolet resented. So Tories with a tinge of Jacobitism, like Sir Chevrolet, were ambivalent, keen to question the legitimacy of 1688, keen to deter the Hanoverian succession, but unwilling to deny Queen Anne's right to the throne. This sort of equivocation is at the heart of what I want to talk about. Now, the trial of Sir Chevrolet was too tempting an opportunity for the makers and sellers of souvenirs and mementos to ignore. Sir Chevrolet was celebrated and remembered in a way that probably only monarchs had previously been. Sir Chevrolet's portraits were plentiful, with dozens of different versions produced in 1710 and subsequent years. Uh, And here are three of them. On the left-hand side, uh, a popular image of the mob's idol. Uh, Quite why Sir Chevrolet has his tongue hanging out, I'm not quite sure. Uh, In the middle, a ceramic portrait. uh, And on the right, a rather more uh, elaborate portrait of Sir Chevrolet holding a picture of Charles I, representing this hereditary sense of monarchy. These are just three of the 80 or so uh, images of Sir Chevrolet that were produced in 1710. Moreover, the memory of Sir Chevrolet among portraitists uh, was very, very, uh, had a very long life. The last portrait of Sir Chevrolet was produced in 1784. Most extraordinarily, the portraits found their way into Hogarth's uh, Harlot's Progress. As I've mentioned, uh, Sir Chevrolet had a huge following among London prostitutes. Uh, and here is Moll Hackabout in the third image uh, of the sequence in her boudoir. Um, and on the left hand side, you can see two portraits hanging in her boudoir. On the right is Dr. Sachevra. So, 20 years after the trial, Hogarth still points out that Sachevra was the prostitute's idol. Sir Chevrolet was a common Christian name uh, for children baptised between 1710 and 1720. There was also a huge outpouring of tracts and broadsides in his support and against him. There were, of course, these were largely popular items, there were, of course, elite items as well. Uh, Sorry, this is a Sir Chevrolet fan, so images of Sir Chevrolet were printed on fans. Uh, But these are two elite items. On the left-hand side, an ivory portrait of Sir Chevrolet, only discovered in 2002. On the right, I'm sorry it's such a poor image, uh, a portrait of Sir Chevrolet in silver on a wooden background, rather like uh, a portrait that was given 
uh, uh, silver on wood to um, Sir Cheverell's defence counsel at his trial, Sir Simon Harcourt. These were clearly very expensive elite objects uh, produced uh, individually for particular, particular supporters. Now, among the entrepreneurs quick to capitalise on the mania for Sir Chevroliana were metal makers. These were foremost in the souvenir market and also supplied numismatists with coins and medallions. Metal makers also saw that the market for such items was divided between Sir Chevrolet's admirers and his opponents. The buyers of Sir Chevrolet medals were able to express these two opinions. One of the medals struck in 1710 could be bought in two forms. This is the loyal uh, medal. So Sir Chevrolet's portrait on the, on the one side and on the other side a mitre and the words is loyal, is firm to thee. Clearly, the meaning is that Sir Cheverell was a firm supporter of the Church of England. But Sir Cheverell's opponents could also buy a medal with the same head, but with a different inscription on the reverse. Is loyal to thee, with a portrait of the Pope. The implication being that Sir Cheverell's loyalties lay with the Catholic Church and the Jacobite Stuart succession. And in fact, if you notice, the portrait of Sir Chevrolet in both is identical. So this is one medal maker who's producing medals for the different ends of the market. These products sum up the ambiguity of Sir Chevrolet's own position as well as the divided nature of the market. They summed up how starkly society was divided towards Sir Chevrolet and the issue of whether to commit uh, itself to the Hanoverian succession or to the restoration of the House of Stuart. So tracts, prints, medals were all means for people to express support or opposition to Sir Chevrolet. Now another object enabled divergent opinions to be expressed about him too, intaglio fob seals. And as I've mentioned, these seals were sometimes made with three faces. Um, these are two examples of three face seals. Uh, I hope you can see that the seals you can turn and a different face emerges. So you would have a seal with three faces that you could use for business or personal use, or you could simply have three images on it, which according to taste, you used uh, to seal your letters. Perhaps also these were objects that in a coffee house or a club, you would show to your friends and, uh, and colleagues and uh, fellow travellers uh, to impress them with your taste and political opinions. Now, two such Sir Chevrolet seals are known. The brackets on which they rest are similar, though not identical, but the size of the seals is identical at, at 41 millimetres high. And the incised head of Sir Chevrolet is identical, although the form of lettering on it is different. Which suggests that, like the medallions, these Sir Chevrolet seals were made by the same maker, but were customised for different uh, purchases or owners. In both cases, the reference to Sir Chevrolet as holding a DD indicates that they were produced after he was awarded the Doctor of the Divinity in 1708. Uh, and almost certainly they were both produced between 1710 and 1714, when Sir Chevrolet mania was at its height. Now, for reasons which will become apparent, I'm going to refer to the first seal as the Loyal Seal. This is a seal in the British Museum, uh, and I shall refer to the second seal that we'll come to as the Disloyal Seal. This is the first face on the loyal seal. So it's a portrait of Sir Chevrolet with the wording H. Sir Chevrolet DD. And I think in, in a bit you'll see that it is pretty much identical to the image on the disloyal seal. The second image on the loyal seal is a profile uh, portrait of Queen Anne, inscribed Anna DG. This was clearly intended to associate 
Sir Chevrolet with Queen Anne to emphasise Sir Chevrolet's claim that he didn't challenge or question the Queen's right to the throne. After all, if you were in a coffee house or a club, you would be showing this to friends who would turn the seal on its swivel and would be able to see Sir Chevrolet and then Queen Anne. The third face on the seal is a monogram, uh, probably MCCM, which has been interpreted by the British Museum catalogue as a reference to Magdalen College, Oxford. Uh, Magdalen College, Collegium Magdalena, I think it would be. Uh, the British Museum catalogue suggests that this third face uh, was intended for use by an official of Magdalen College, Oxford. Now, this clearly wasn't an official seal. That wouldn't have been a portable item. Uh, I suppose it could have been uh, a seal used by a college official uh, while they were travelling away from the college. Uh, or it could simply be that these are the initials of the owner, which I think is an equally plausible explanation. Uh, but the third, third seal was clearly a personalisation of the seal to an institution or to an individual. Either way, the loyal seal clearly associates the Chevrolet with the legitimacy of Queen Anne. And we couldn't possibly say that it had any whiff of Jacobite leanings. It's the sort of seal that a Tory fellow of Magdalen College might well own, um, but then it could be owned by anybody who was a, uh, a supporter of both Sir Chevrolet and Queen Anne. The second seal, the disloyal seal, is very different indeed and gives an alternative version of the purpose and principles behind such a seal. It also features Sir Chevrolet's head in profile. The disloyal seal is one on the right hand side. I, I'm sorry that the images of these seals are difficult to capture with lighting, but I hope you can see that the seal on the right hand side and the seal on the left hand side, they are in fact, uh, despite the photography of identical size, are both comparable images of Henry Sir Chevrolet. In this case, the, the lettering is DD Sir Chevrolet. Now, the second face on the disloyal seal is very different. And it depicts a cherub holding a crown over an altar on which there's a small flame burning. The inscription, although it's damaged, seems to be poor circonstensu, which doesn't translate readily from French. It may be Norman French for, for saying it. It doesn't appear to be a family motto. It doesn't appear to be a known phrase. But if it is Norman French for the, the phrase for saying it, it could be an exhortation to proclaim adherence to Sir Chevrolet's ideals and therefore of the hereditary right of the Stuarts to the throne of Britain. The image of the cherub, crown and altar on the second face, it seems to me is difficult to interpret as anything other than a reference to the divinely sanctioned nature of monarchy and the hereditary nature of kingship. Perhaps the inscription is a reference to Sir Chevrolet's willingness to speak of the nature of monarchy. Clearly, this divine right nature of kingship was a Jacobite theme. Uh, it represented the base on which they sought to restore the Stuarts to the throne. So associating Sir Chevrolet's portrait with this sort of image, which could only be uh, uh, regarded as a Jacobite image, was clearly politically dangerous. It's difficult to imagine the occasion on which you would be able to seal a document with this image um, without it attracting some attention as it passed through the post office. The third face on the seal is something of a mystery. Uh, it's an armorial bearing. The arms show a shield on cross anchors, which is characteristic of certain offices in the French Ancien Regime. In France, two anchors 
in saltire behind the arms denotes the general of the galleys, which is a high naval appointment. The eight-pointed star, uh, or, uh, or yes, the eight-pointed star probably indicates that the owner was a knight of the order of St. John of Malta or possibly of the order of Lazarus. The coronet is in French style uh, and the cross is behind and below the shield, but also unknown in English heraldic use. So the armorial bearing is unknown, unidentified, it probably represents an exile at the Jacobite court in France in 1710 and perhaps a Catholic aristocrat. So there are two Sir Chevrolet seals, one loyal, the other disloyal, almost certainly made by the same seal maker, almost certainly as bespoke items for two people with diametrically opposed political principles. The loyal seal may well have been widely seen by friends of the owner, the disloyal seal probably by only a very few because of its whiff of treason. Now a question arises, were the Sacheverell seals ever used? Well, the British Museum catalogue shows two examples of the use of such seals featuring Sacheverell uh, in British Library additional manuscripts uh, in which the seals were used in the 1740s. Francis Falcon and Madden identified the use of such a seal on, on a document in the Summers Cox papers in the Surrey History Centre, also dating from the 1740s. My own research has revealed other examples, a conveyance of land in Bedfordshire in April 1714 bears an image of Sir Chevrolet, uh, and a counterpart a seal on a lease for land at Morlinch in Somerset in 1725 also bears the image of Sir Chevrolet. When this lecture was advertised, Dr Christopher Wright, who I hope is in the audience, uh, of the British Library very kindly drew my attention to a Sir Chevrolet seal impress on a document which he owns, a document which dates from 1711. So it was sealed very soon after the height of Sir Chevrolet mania. That document was a financial bond signed by Archippus Kippax, the Archdeacon of the Isle of Man and Vicar of Ormskirk in Lancashire. This is the only surviving use of the seal by a clergyman, which I think makes it quite significant. Further investigation of the seal in the Summers Cox papers at the Harry Surrey History Centre reveals that two of the parties to the deed, William Golding and William Glassbrook, were hot factors from the parish of St. Saviour's Southwark, the parish in which Sir Chevrolet was a chaplain from 1710. According to Geoffrey Holmes, the distinguished historian of the Sir Chevrolet trial, Brewers and other related tradesmen were particularly keen supporters of Sir Chevrolet in 1710. In all of the cases of the use of Sir Chevrolet seals, the purpose seems to be for legal authentication of a document rather than securing the privacy of a letter to go in the post. These impressions suggest that while the seals may have been bought uh, in the period of or immediately after the trial, they remained in use, perhaps as family, personal or business seals, long after Sir Chevrolet died in 1724. Like the portraits of Sir Chevrolet, the seals featuring his image lost their appeal and popularity only very slowly. Moreover, they were prized objects. They were made from iron with a very high carbon content. In fact, um, on these, the rust uh, on, on these iron seals is very, very slight, um, which suggests they're made with a very, very high com content, and therefore they were, these were expensive elite items, uh, quite difficult to produce and would have been very costly. The uh, disloyal seal hangs on a fi very fine chain in which there are jeweled links of crystal, and clearly as a fob seal, they were designed for display suggesting that the owner wore it personally on his body. The existence of two seals representing such different sets of political principles suggests that the market for high-end, expensive Sir Chevrolet commemorative items, including seals and medals, was the most politically differentiated. 
The wealthy who wanted to show their support for Sir Chevron, the high churchman, could buy a loyalist seal and use it without impugning, indeed explicitly endorsing, Queen Anne's title to the throne. Those who wanted to allude to their own principles of the divine character of the monarchy and associate them with Sir Chevron could do so in a seal which hinted broadly at treason. It's difficult, as I've said, to imagine the occasion on which a disloyal seal would be openly used. In France, perhaps, among the exile court, it would have been more easily used than in England. These disloyal objects were part of a flourishing culture of Jacobitism that included jewellery, glassware, ceramics, books, and small personal items such as snuff boxes. They grew in popularity in the years after 1714. The fob seal could be easily placed in a pocket small enough to be hidden from the views of others. But what both of these seals suggest is that sigillographers have called time on the significance of seals far too early. That seals were still commissioned and used as personal and ideological objects into the 18th century suggests that we ought to pay more attention to them in this period. Thank you.